Good evening, Kingdom citizens. Welcome to our Bible study. And may I say good morning to maybe some of you, because you may be watching it in the morning. Uh, we are so grateful for this new time that we're in. We're not locked in to 7 o'clock on Wednesday evenings. We can watch uh, the Bible study at any time after, after it's been posted. Um, so we do invite you to, uh, um, to join us in our study to our video recording of the Bible study. Some of you have already maybe been in your small group classes and you've gone through the lesson. But hopefully there will be some new thoughts that will come through in the video recording as well. Let's pray together. And dear Lord, we thank you for this new day that you've given to us. Thank you for your faithfulness and your loving kindness. Thank you for your tender mercies and for all that you've done for us, doing and will do. Uh, open our hearts now uh, to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church and give each one of us a grateful heart. We would ask in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, uh, our lesson this week uh, is, help, helps us to get closer and closer to Thanksgiving. We are getting very, very close to Thanksgiving. And we pray that your heart will be challenged and encouraged to be thankful, and that throughout this month, your heart will be thankful. Our lesson last week, one of the things that the, uh, the presenter, uh, the teacher, shared was uh, how his mother did some really, really special things for him in terms of special meals that he enjoyed and, um, and just having a grateful heart. One of the things that is certainly missing from our world today there is a great need for a spirit of gratitude. There is a great need for a spirit of gratitude. And our lesson this month, uh, our emphasis is building and rebuilding a heart of gratitude. I believe that one of the greatest challenges that we have in, the modern, in our modern society, particularly in America, particularly in Sumter, South Carolina, is teaching our children and grandchildren the importance of being grateful. Many young people today do not demonstrate gratefulness. You do something for them, they never think to say thank you. Um, uh, we, I grew up in an era where that was expected and you could get punished for not saying thank you for someone who did something for you. Even if, and this is, one that, this is something I've learned to appreciate, even if it was a very small or minute thing, we were always taught to be thankful. Uh, if a parent or a grandparent, when I was a child, if my grandmother sent me to uh, pick up something from someone's house, she would say to me, make sure you say to Miss uh, Mary Ellen, thank you. That was, one of, that was a part of what I was supposed to do. Our thought for the month is kingdom citizens know that God is worthy of our thanksgiving and we must uh, credit him for every good and perfect gift. They know or we know that gratefulness moves our focus um, off selfish desires and helps us remember that God is in control. Thankfulness, and this is good here, thankfulness is healthy and beneficial to us. Thankfulness is healthy and beneficial to us. Um, if, in fact, I, I believe there are some, some studies that have shown that thankful people even live longer. Uh, our words and praises for the month are giving thanks, grateful praise, appreciation and joy. Our uh, lesson today uh, is entitled Grateful Praise. Our questions to consider, this is lesson 47, our questions to consider, uh, first of all says, do you find it difficult at times to worship God um, with joyful songs? And my question to you would be, why? Not just yes or no, but why? why? Why is it that there are times that people find it difficult to worship God uh, with joyful songs, particularly in difficult times? Um, one writer said that some people have a less grateful brain. That's an interesting 
uh, thought to me. Some people, that's, that's their built. Uh, there's just something about the way you are, are, are made. You typically go to the negative rather than to the positive. Someone else says that it's a personality pitfall. Our genes and our brains aren't um, at the end of the story. Certain personality factors can also act as a barrier to gratitude. In particular, and this is interesting, look at, listen at this list. In particular, envy, materialism, narcissism, and cynicism can be brought, uh, can be thought of as thieves of thankfulness. And my brothers and my sisters, I want to tell you that all of us experience thieves of thankfulness in our lives from time to time. In other words, there are things that come along to steal um, thankfulness from us. And just three more. Uh, one, I would think, is trouble. One is depression. And one may be anger. Those are some things I believe that make it difficult for us um, at times to worship God with joyful songs or, or with joy. The second question says, are there times in your life when praising God gets uh, you through? And I think that these are some of the times that praising God can really help us get through what we're dealing with at the moment. I think death, when we have death in our families, I think praising God can help us uh, um, get through the loss of death experience. And I'm grateful to our pastor um, for encouraging us that when we have death in our families, not to stay home, but come into the fellowship. He acknowledges that it's not always easy, but do it anyhow because you're going to get many more benefits from it than if you stay at home um, and watch it on TV or on, on video or something else. I think the second um, uh, time that it may be difficult, um, or we can, we can use praise to get us through difficult times, would be when we've been disappointed. You know, uh, in my life, there have been times I didn't get the job I wanted. That was a huge disappointment. I remember one time, I thought I was going to get hired by a school district for a teaching position and didn't. Um, in fact, it was very, very challenging because the job had really been promised to me, but in the final analysis, they hired someone else instead of me. And so that was very disappointing. But one of the things I have known for a long time and still press into in my own life, and that is that God is sovereign. And that no matter what people do, God is still in control of my present and my future. And I think also uh, the loss of other significant relationships um, those are times that praising can get us through. You know, if you were dating someone and the relationship ends, um, if you had a really good friendship with someone and a situation caused that friendship to end, um, if you, uh, 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 again, you may have a, a, a situation where you've had a great neighbor for a long time and for some reason that neighbor has moved now to another part of the world and you just don't have that. And there's a sense of loss. And of course, uh, let us not miss divorce. Divorce uh, is a loss of a significant relationship. And so we have, to, we have to learn to praise God in the difficult time. And one of, the, one of the most difficult ones has to do with death, but it has to do with the death of a child. Um, I think for any of us, the death of a child is probably one, one of the most um, difficult situations in life to get over. I think it's even more difficult than the death of a parent uh, or even the death of a spouse or can be because most of us expect, we don't want them to, but most of us expect that our parents will die before we do. We know that our spouses may die before we do, but we never expect our children to die before we do. So that's a, that's a tremendous loss. And so praising can help us in a great deal there. Number three, I love, I, I absolutely love question three. Can you pinpoint generational blessings in your family? In fact, when I first started reading this, I thought we were going to do generational cursing because we talk about generational cursings a great deal, but we don't talk about generational blessings very often. 
Um, and I just listed three here. One, one of my family's generational blessings to me is prayer. You've heard me say a million times, my grandmother was a woman of prayer. Uh, she prayed through the family, and I've learned to do the same thing. She, uh, today, uh, 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 I pray for my nieces and nephews uh, uh, on a regular basis. You know, my, my son and grandson, is, uh, they are given. You know, I'm going to pray for them every day. But I pray for my nieces and nephews, and I pray for my cousins. And, um, and I have a ton of godsons, that some I've adopted, and some that were actually, parents actually asked me to be their godparents. And I pray uh, for them. So I've learned to to pray for God's little people. That comes, uh, that's a generational blessing that we have. And then uh, compassion. Compassion is something that was demonstrated in my family over and over again. Um, I, I remember two of my aunts, one who had some mental health challenges and her sister that she seemed to, for some reason, hate or she would just go after in very, very cruel ways. But that was a sister who helped her a lot. And I learned from that particular aunt the importance of caring for people, even though sometimes they are not nice to you, or even sometimes they're cruel to you. So compassion is one of those things that have been demonstrated in our family for generations. And then the love of children. Um, I grew up in a family. I grew up, I, if you know anything about me, you know that I come from a huge family. My mother was one of 11 children. Um, my grandmother had nine, uh, 10 girls and one boy. And uh, when my grandmother died in 1982, she had uh, 55 grandchildren, 88 great-grandchildren, and 28 great-great-grandchildren. Um, and so I come from a huge family, but there was always a love of children. Um, in our families, uh, or in my family, so, so among my cousins, a lot of us lived together at different points. Many of us grew up like sisters and brothers rather than cousins because of the kind of time that we spent with one another. Because there was a great love not only in my grandmother, but also in my aunts that allowed us to be able to, you know, we would stay in one home or the other. It was, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun to be able to grow up like that. And then they not only loved us, but they loved other people's children. If you were, if you were in our house when a meal was served, you're going to eat with us. You're not going, they're not going to send you home and then feed us. They're going to feed you as well. Even if they have to break that piece of bread another time, they were going to feed you as well. So those are just some generational things. I can go on and on when you talk about family, how God has blessed us through family. Our text today is a very rich text, and for many of you that have grown up in church, uh, or have been in church for any significant amount of time, you are very familiar with this, this song. I want to read it uh, from the um, New King James Version, because many of us, if not most of us, are familiar with this um, uh, psalm from the King James Version, and the New King James is very similar. Uh, and then I want to read from the message version. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. The message puts it this way. On your feet now, applaud God. Bring a gift of laughter. Sing yourselves into his presence. Know this, God is God, and God, God, he made us. He didn't, uh, we didn't make ourselves. We are his people, his well-tendered sheep. Enter with the password, which is thank you. I love that. Make yourselves at home talking praise. Thank him. Worship him. 
For God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal always, forever and ever. Wow, how powerful that is. Yeah, so uh, again, the message gives us a little bit different view of this. And as we go into the, the, the uh, commentary in our book, um, uh, uh, it, it, it helps us with this as well. Because the author uses uh, a couple of different versions of the text uh, with the verses that we have here today. The heart of the lesson says, worship brings thanksgiving, grateful praise, and victory. Kingdom citizens must understand the power of praise and worship. May I ask you, do you understand the power of praise and worship? This well-known song, emphasizing the universal nature of God's kingship, is a benediction to the series of psalms um, which, occupied, which are occupied with the Lord's kingdom rule, Psalm 93 through 100. Most of all, it calls to praise and thanksgiving, while verse 3 and 5 fix reasons for worship. The two main components of this psalm are one, a call to praise the Lord, and two, a call to thank the Lord. This first component to the psalm is for kingdom citizens to praise the Lord and to do it with a joyful or with a shout of joy or a joyful shout. The King James Version says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. This implies a verbal praise for all people. Then verse 2 admonishes us to serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. We should be grateful to serve the Lord, but a more appropriate term would be worship the Lord with gladness. What about your worship? Uh, is it just something else you do, or is it something you have to go to on Sunday morning? Uh, you know, you're trying to get this out of the way so you can get to the rest of your day, or is this something that you do with gladness? Also, we must come to the Lord with praise. Then verse 3 admonishes us to know that the Lord is God. We must know without uh, a shadow of doubt or without wavering that God is Lord. The second component of the psalm is a call to give thanks to the Lord. Uh, the text says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. God alone is worthy of being worshiped. The kingdom citizens, and kingdom citizens must have an attitude of gratitude uh, when they come to worship. Then the psalm ends with, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Do you know today that the Lord is good, that his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations? It makes a difference. I think there are some really, really good explanation here that the, that the writer, the commentator, has made um, thoughts that the commentator has shared with us. Um, again, true worship comes out of the heart. Do you have a heart of worship? Uh, are you on the same page that God is on? The, the first outline says that kingdom citizens know that it's critical for believers to worship and give God joyful praise. David, the author of this psalm, tells us to acknowledge the Lord, acknowledge that the Lord is God. Huh. Huh. We'll come back to that in just a minute. He then, he, he then tells us why and how to acknowledge God. We acknowledge and worship him when we shout our praises, appreciate his status as creator, accept his authority in every detail of life, 
enthusiastically um, agreeing with the guidance he gives and express our thanks for his unfailing love. God is our creator. We did not create ourselves. Let's go back to that first sentence. David, the author of the psalm, tells us to acknowledge God, acknowledge that the Lord is God. Have you in your life acknowledged that the Lord is God, that Jehovah is God? Have you acknowledged that? You know, we live in a, a day and age now, particularly in our country, where there's a lot of inclusion. We want to include everybody. We want to include the Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, and everybody else. But none of them are God. The one difference between those guys and our God, our God showed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And you can go to the tomb of Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, and their bodies are still in the ground. Their bones are there. But in Jerusalem, there is an empty tomb where our God rested for three days. And he's alive forevermore. So we have to know that, he, that he's God. What does that mean? It means then that no matter what you're going through today, what you're dealing with, that God is in full charge and in full control. We've got, we've got to recognize that. We have to acknowledge that. We have to lean into that. And that's very, that's very, very important. Now, who God is in your life will determine a lot in terms of your praise. If he's on the peripheral, you know, you know, he's, to you he's a man upstairs, which I think is a, just a huge disrespect to God. The God we, don't, we should be referring to the God of the universe as the man upstairs. He is the creator, he is the redeemer, he is the restorer of our lives. We need to acknowledge him for who he is. And, that, and all of this makes a difference when we praise him particularly during the difficult times of our lives. So do I understand that on my worst day, that God, he, uh, that God is my Lord, that the Lord our God is one? Do I understand on my worst day that God is sovereign, that no matter what has happened today, it has not happened outside of his view. God is not surprised when I bring my prayers to him about this situation. God is not undermined by it. God is not trying to catch up and say, Nate, I'm sorry, I didn't even know that was going to happen. He already knows. And knowing, he's already prepared to take care of me in this situation. We need to acknowledge, I need to acknowledge that the Lord, he is God. Number two, kingdom citizens know that in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. Have you experienced that recently? Have you experienced a fullness of joy that comes from being in the presence of the Lord? God is worthy of being worshipped. What is your attitude toward worship? What do you understand worship to be? It's interesting that we often say, I am going to worship. Some say, well, we have the worship before the preaching. For the believer, worship is not a place or a time. Worship is a lifestyle. God alone is worthy of being worshipped. What is your attitude toward worship? Do you willingly and joyfully come into God's presence, or are you just going through the motions? It's interesting to me that in our churches, we often think that if a person raised their hand when a song is being sung or a preacher is preaching, or if a person says amen, or, or if a person clapped their hand, we think that they are truly engaged in worship. We think, in fact, oftentimes we think of them as being spiritual. Well, 
that is not necessarily, that's not always true necessarily. Sometimes those are just things that we have been programmed to do. We need to understand uh, 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 that we need to come into the presence of God willingly and joyfully. Can I give you an example? And, 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 and we are Baptists. And I've been in the Baptist church most of my life. I spent a few years in an AME church, but, but Baptist has been my baby. Okay, that's been my teaching. That's been my doctrine. Uh, I'm Baptistic in doctrine. So, growing up Baptist, when I was 12 years old, guess what my grandmother told me I needed to do? My grandmother said, you are not 12 years old. You need to join the church and be baptized. I got to tell you, I did it, but I really didn't understand the significance of it. I did it because in the Baptist church, 12-year-olds were to be baptized. And so I did it. I, I wonder if some of, for some of us, if our, that's our worship. So... We're supposed to, quote unquote, we're supposed to go to church on Sunday to worship. So that's what we do. But do we really worship? Because sometimes when the song goes long, oh, when is the song going to end? The preacher gets up there to preach, oh man, when is he going to stop? When is she going to stop? I think that sometimes we are deceiving ourselves into thinking that we are worshiping when we really are not. Or maybe you are a hospitality member, a member of a healthcare team, or an usher, and before you come into the sanctuary, someone ticks you off. You tell them to put on a mask. They say, I'm not going to put on a mask. You tell them you need to sit here. I don't want to sit here. Okay? And you can't tell. Okay, so you, you've already become confrontational with somebody. And now they're thinking about Jesus as the answer for the world today. And you're trying to get into the spirit of worship, and, it, and it's not, it, it ain't happening. Because worship is much more about our walk and our relationship with God. This psalm tells us to remember God's goodness and dependability. And so sometimes, as a Christian, we have to reset in the sanctuary in order to truly worship in spirit and in truth. We have to reset in our mind. And so we have to remind ourselves that the Lord is good. I've not come to worship people. I've not come to please people. I've come to honor God. To remember God's goodness. And grateful praise for who he is. Now, praise is not about what God has done. Thanksgiving is much more about what God has done. Praise is about who God is. And who God is is, what, is is who he was even before I was. In fact, before I was born, God is. God is God, before I was born, God is the creator of the universe. Before I was born, God, through his son Christ Jesus, is the redeemer of the world. Before I was born, God is good. You know, we, we started saying the words God is good all the time, all the time God is good. But God was good before we started saying God is good. Because that's who he is. So, it also implies that at times we must force ourselves to worship and praise God as he takes us through the situations of life. There's no doubt about it. That's a great statement. That's one that's worth underlining. That's one that's worth highlighting. That sometimes we have to uh, uh, force ourselves. And over what we're really doing is that we're bringing ourselves back in alignment with the Word of God, with the Spirit of God. As you consider this particular Bible study, as you read it on your own, as you go through it, would you say that your life is in alignment with God? Now, I'm not a mechanic, but, it, but my mechanic tells me often that when my truck is out of alignment, that can cause a lot of other problems in my vehicle or to my vehicle, even in the way that it rides. I wonder, my brothers and my sisters, what does spiritual, uh, 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 spirit, when you are spiritually out of alignment, what does that look like? 
Maybe that, maybe that will help us to better understand some of the angry Christians in the church. Some of the disgruntled deacons or, 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 or passive preachers. Because we are out of alignment with God and with his word and with his wisdom and with his way. Can I just tell you that one of the easiest ways to get back into alignment is to find a place of praise and thanksgiving in your own life. One of, one of the challenges we have as Christians is a lot of stuff that we do are in the public's eye. Well, we need private worship if our public worship is going to mean very much. And finally, kingdom citizens know that God's blessings, love, faithfulness, and provisions flow through generations. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Is there anybody who's willing to just say, Lord, thank you? Because the same God that took care of me, that took care of my mother, took care of my grandmother and my great-grandmother, that same God will take care of my son, my grandson, and my great-grandson. Yeah. So uh, I need to understand that God's faithfulness and his provisions flow through generations. Thank you, God. God is the source and perfect example of love, faithfulness, mercy, truth, and everything that is provided for life and success. David sums up this uh, powerful song by saying, For the Lord is good. Do I have any witnesses out there? For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. David makes uh, the point uh, that God's goodness, his love, his mercy, his truth, his faithfulness, and his lordship flows to all generations. So I say to you today, as I close, do you have a grateful praise? God, we have a lot to thank God for. Do you, do, do you have two eyes where you can see? Do you have two hands that you can touch? Do you have two ears where you can hear? Do you have a mouth that you can speak? Do you have the ability to, do you know where you are, who you are, and who you are with? We need to praise God. God gave me a gift. In fact, he gave me two gifts this week that were very precious to me. I won't go into details about them. Both of them were unexpected. And I simply said, thank you, Lord. Someone said to me earlier this week, you know, Nate, God is able to bless you without giving you money. And that is so true. Sometimes what he does is he takes away some of our debt. He takes away some of our hurt. He takes away some of our disappointment. So what I say to you today, ask the Lord, if you don't have a heart of thanksgiving, ask the Lord to give you a heart of thanksgiving. Would you bow your heads with me? Because I want to just close by reading this psalm again. And we're going to make this our prayer today. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. In the name of Jesus, amen.